Hey, welcome to worship this morning. Uh, we're glad that you're joining us today. Uh, whether you've worshiped with us a bunch of times or maybe this is your first time, uh, we're excited to have you with us this morning. Uh, as we continue to talk about some resurrection truths, some things that are true for us as followers of Jesus, uh, as Jesus has risen from the dead, and now we go on each life living in that new life in him as well. And so today we're going to talk about the things that are foundational for us, something that's foundational for our families, for our households, whatever that might look like for you, and, uh, and for our church in Jesus, something that's true no matter what's happening in this world. So we're glad that you've joined us again. May God bless you in this time of worship. Would you join me in a word of prayer? Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for bringing us together in this way today as we gather around your word and with your presence. And so we pray that you would continue to bless us in this time through the songs that we sing, to the words that we speak, and to your word, which we hear, that we may go and put into practice in our life. We pray that you would bring us your comfort, your peace, and your hope through your word and our Savior Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Would you please join with me in the words of confession that are printed for you on the screen. We pray together. O oh Lord, I confess that I have sinned against you and those I love. I have sin said things to cause pain and I have kept silent when my words would have helped and witness to your love. I admit my thoughts, actions, and words have not been those of a child of God. Forgive me, Father, for Jesus' sake. Help me to hear and understand your teaching. Help me to believe and to use what you have taught me to live a life that is pleasing to you. In your name I pray. Amen. The words today uh, from our first reading come from the book of First Peter, beginning in the second chapter and the second verse. Like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up into salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious. You yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house, to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word as they are destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellences of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you have not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. So in the stead and by the command of the one who gives us his mercy, your sins are forgiven. And as he tells a woman who is caught in adultery, go and sin no more. And you who have been baptized into the Spirit know that you have the power to fight against those impulses and to honor those around you and the one who has given you mercy today. Go in his peace.
The Holy Gospel is from the 14th chapter of John, beginning in the first verse. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you that I go prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you also may be. You know the way to where I'm going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is good enough for us. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long, and you do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, Show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak of my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. Or else believe on the account of the works themselves. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do. Because I'm going to the Father, and whoever asks in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. This is the word of the Lord.
grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father, from our Lord and our Savior Jesus. Amen. Hey, we continue this sermon series, Resurrection Truths, as we're on Resurrection Truth number five, which deals with God's foundation for every home, for every family, for every life, for, for every church. And right now, I think it's probably a time when we're looking for something that is firm and secure and certain for a foundation of our life as things continue to change, uh, even as we get new plans that come out for reopening things or like in our state, Restore Illinois, and, and yet we're not quite sure how that timeline's going to go. Uh, we just are desperate for something certain. Uh, and today there's a truth that is certain and trustworthy for us uh, as we jump into uh, John and to First Peter. So as we do that, would you, would you pray with me? Uh, gracious Heavenly Father, as we come before you today, uh, gathered in all the ways that you have us gathered and yet still around your word and, and with your people, the church, Lord, we just pray that uh, the words of my mouth and the meditation of those who are gathered uh, would be acceptable in your sight as our strength and our redeemer. Amen. So um, the question for you, uh, how many of you like a specific plan? Or you want to have a plan where you know the timeline, you know the details, you know the specifics, you know what to expect, and you know what's coming, because then you can plan, right? Or maybe, maybe you're the person who kind of just prefers to, to go with the flow of it. I don't know, but I think right now uh, we probably all feel like we'd like to have some kind of plan in place and at least know a little bit about what's coming for our future, right? If we just had a better handle on the facts, life would be different. If we just knew more about a, a very specific plan and it got into the details, man, that would just change everything, right? If we knew for sure what would happen, when it would happen, and how it would happen, wouldn't life just be so much better? I mean, for us, if, if we just had that plan for our families, we we could make plans and, and we'd know what's happening and we would know what's going to happen with our kids' future and how that would affect their school and everything else, or, or even for our church, right? How and when do we get to reopen and do some things that we've been longing to do for a while? We wish that we had those kinds of plans. I don't know how you see it, if you like the specific plans or, or maybe just kind of go with it, uh, but Jesus' disciples certainly wanted a plan, too. And I think what's great is here in John chapter 14, we see that, that they wanted some specifics. They wanted to know what was going on. After all, Jesus had just got done telling them that one of them was going to betray him. And that's going to be hard news for all of them to hear. And they go, well, we've got some questions now, Jesus. And then Jesus even tells Peter, Peter, you're going to betray me. And they go, well, we've got some questions about that now, Jesus. What is this plan? What is this future going to look like? It, it sounds like some pretty troubling stuff. And so um, they kind of jump into it in John chapter 14. Um, there's a, a future ahead for them that certainly is uncertain. And I'm, I'm sure that they're probably confused and they're probably anxious as well. And so they, they want some answers. Um, and, and they don't want just sort of like vague stuff. Right? Give us some facts, Jesus. Tell us about this, this way that we're supposed to go. Tell us about how this is going to look, because we don't know, and we might be a little scared. Right? Give us some clear directions by which we can navigate the troublesome future that might be to come. I don't know about you, but I, I think we can probably relate to that right now, right? So, so what does Jesus do? Does he go on? He, he give them this clearly defined playbook with caveats for every conceivable scenario that, that gives them comfort and, and confidence in all the details, right? No. He doesn't give them that. He, he gives them just two things that we see in, in John chapter 14. Jesus gives them his promise and he gives them his presence. He doesn't say it won't be hard, or he doesn't say that no matter what comes, here's all the special things you do for each scenario or each challenge or each difficulty. He just gives them his promise and his presence. And, and those things are powerful for them. In verse 2 and 4 uh, of John chapter 14, it says, In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? Right? Jesus is saying his promise is that he is working on their behalf. 
Right? I go to prepare a place for you. I'm working on your behalf. We know that God is working for us. He is always at work. Right? And Scripture tells us that in all things, God is at work for the good of those who love him, that he can take even the worst things in life and bring something good for it, good from it for us. And he says that not only is he, is he working, but he's preparing a place for them. Right? He's, he's looking beyond this current suffering. It's a future beyond what they're dealing with now. It's beyond their anxieties, beyond their questions, that he has this future in store. He's preparing this place for them. He gives them this promise. And as he does that, he takes the focus off of their, their unknown future in their present time and their feeling of helplessness and inability, and he, and he puts, it, puts it on what is known, and that is what God is going to and is doing. So that now they're not looking at, at the here and the now. His answer for them is his promise that looks beyond today and into a future that he has in store for them. And then he also says, right, he also says, I go to prepare a place for you. Uh, and if, it, if, it, uh, if I go to prepare a place for you in verse three, I, I will come again and will take you to myself that where I am, you may be also. So he says, I'm working. I'm preparing a place for you, and I will come back to take you to be with myself. So in the middle of their questions, their anxieties, their we want a timeline for this kind of thing. We want some details, Jesus. He gives them that promise. And that promise gives them sight of, of what is outside of their current circumstance. And as he does that, he brings them comfort. See, what, what we experience in the here and now, in any given moment, um, this time included, is often what informs the way that, that we feel. But what God has given us is faith that clings to something outside of our current circumstance. It clings to something outside of how we feel now, and it's not changed by circumstance. It holds on to Jesus and to his promises which is that he is working on our behalf, right? That he is preparing a place for us and that he will take us to be with him. So his promise shifts our eyes from, from the current unknowns to his enduring love and his enduring promise and the fact that he has a, a future for us. So he gives them a promise, but then he also speaks of his presence with them. Later in verse, uh, in verse 6, he talks about his presence because Thomas has some questions now, right? And Thomas says, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How are we going to know how to get there? And so Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. All right, so Jesus gives them his, his presence that he is the way. He is the way for now, for today. He is the truth that you can trust in, and he is life, that is a, a new creation kind of life, right? That he's, he's not going to leave you. He's not going to forsake you. He gives you the promise that his presence is here and for you. Uh, and they might go, well, what does this road look like ahead? And they don't, they don't know. But with Jesus, we know we're on the right way, even if there's suffering that comes in the midst of it. Right? And so Jesus, as he gives them his presence, also gives them guidance as they walk into the future as unknown and as uncertain as it is. He gives them his promise and he gives them his presence. And then as we hear those words of Jesus, maybe the words in verse one have a deeper meaning for us. Maybe, maybe they bring greater comfort for us and maybe for his disciples too. Because Jesus started all of this off in chapter 14 by saying, Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. Right? Let not your hearts be troubled. I gave you a, a promise and a presence to believe in God and believe also in me. See, what Jesus does for his disciples and what he does for you and me in this time is he invites us into a life of trust in him. It's easy for us to look at so many other things in this world and place our trust in those things and place our hope in those things. If we just had the details, if we just had the timeline, if we just knew where we were at on that timeline, then life would be okay. And it's hard not to know. 
But what Jesus invites us into is a life of trust in something greater, in, in him. Right? It, what is to come is likely going to be hard. It certainly was for the disciples. The things that were coming for them were difficult and challenging and tested them. And it is for us too. And, and recovering from the suffering experience can often seem absolutely insurmountable. And, and we may not know quite what that recovery is going to look like, or it might feel like it's just never going to come. But he invites us to a life of trust. Right, we don't know the, the ultimate effects of the virus on life and death or on economy and on the world as a whole. Jesus invites us to a life of trust. Right, and we don't know what the whole timeline will be or what will come again. But Jesus invites us to a life of trust. And we know that as we hear in First Peter, we just read it earlier actually, that as we place our trust in God, it's never, it's never misplaced. Uh, in First Peter chapter 2, we see in verse 6, as, as uh, Peter is quoting from some Old Testament scriptures, and he says, Behold, I'm laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. But as our trust and belief is in Jesus, it is not put to shame. So when we trust in the Lord, that trust is never misplaced. God doesn't let us down. He doesn't put us to shame. That cornerstone, that foundation, like we talked about, the, the resurrection truth, the foundation for, for every home, every life, for our church, being Jesus. It doesn't crumble. It doesn't decay. It doesn't change with the headlines of the day. But we can safely put our confidence in Jesus. For his promise is certain. And with hope that comes from Jesus, that hope forms for us as Christians the way we see the future. It informs our relationship to the future. Because with hope, we look forward to whatever may come in full confidence in our God. The disciples certainly had to do that. As Jesus said, I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life. And they knew that that challenging things were ahead, that the way seemed uncertain for them. And Jesus says, I am the way. That what was true was going to be challenged. And Jesus says, I'm the truth. And that even life itself might come to an end for Jesus and for them. And yet Jesus says, I am, I am the life. And so in that wonderful words in First Peter, right, that this cornerstone, Jesus, Right, is chosen and precious by God. Whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. I think those are some great words for us as well. But, but later then, we hear too that what God has done for us, and he talks about who we are then, as he's given us a promise, he's given us his presence. And in First Peter, he says, You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Right? This, is, this is who we are. You are precious to God, even in the difficult and struggling and challenging times. That he has called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. That means as, as people who, who live in Jesus, we can truly see things the way that they are. That this is not the end. That though this suffering is difficult and, and seems un, uh, too hard to overcome, we know that there is a future that God has given us, and his promise points our eyes to that future. That he is a, a way for us to follow. He is a truth that we can trust, and he is a life that is that of a new creation for us today. But that his, Jesus' death and resurrection become the foundation for all of our life as he brings us together as that cornerstone as a church, as his people, as his followers. I like these words as well in verse 10, as we might feel like we're going through much of this isolated. Um, maybe you have other people at home with you, maybe you don't. And yet these words point us back to this greater body, the church. 
that God has brought us into and says, you don't weather these storms alone. It may feel like that at some times, but, but you are not alone. He says in verse 10, once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Right? Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. That through Jesus Christ, this cornerstone who gives us a promise and who gives us his presence as the way, as the truth, as a life, he, he makes us his people, right? the church of which he is the foundation for today and for always. And so that, that resurrection truth is always true for us, but it's certainly true in this time for us. Right, that the foundation of our life is not on the things that can crumble and decay, but the foundation of our lives now is in the death and the resurrection of Jesus, who calls us his people and invites us into a life of trust in him. So may God be with you as you live today in the peace and the hope that come from our Savior Jesus. Amen. Thank you very much, Pastor Greg, for that uh, incredibly great uh, message on, on, on the foundations that we live by. And also celebrating Mother's Day this, this today. We hope that you are blessed in your experience with your mom. Uh, if you can't be with her, call her. If you're missing her because she's passed away, you know, just take a couple of moments just to reflect back on what she gave you. On the screen today, um, we have some encouragement for you how to give here at Bethel Church. We are a church that loves kids. And we really hope that you appreciate that we are missing our children big time, either at the school or the Sunday school, even the youth group. We miss having young people around us. And so um, we want you to be aware that this is what Bethel is kind of for, uh, to, to grow up young people to know Jesus in a way that's meaningful, in a way that's practical, in a way that's uh, honoring to him, but also makes a difference in the world. So again, uh, the offerings that we, we let you, uh, you, can, you can mail them in to the church office. You can text them in, you can, you can give to on the website, but we just want you to be a part of our kingdom of helping each other out and, and how we can help uh, the world out at this time. With that, I want to ask you to please join with me now in speaking the words of the Apostles' Creed. Uh, it's, it's about the foundation on which we have built and speak our faith. We speak this together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come the judge, the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. So I ask you to please now join with me in, in the prayers uh, that we have. And we're going to give some time of silence to, to just offer up uh, a prayer that you might be having personally right now. Or if you don't have anything that pops in your head, why don't you just give God thanks for the gift of your mom, if she's still with us, or if she's not. Just give God thanks and just speak her name either out loud or to yourself. So we pray together, O oh, Heavenly Father, you are so incredibly awesome, and we acknowledge that you've given us way more than we deserve. You've also given us a plan to follow, for we know that you will, your Son will return and will take us to be with you in heaven. For that we give you thanks. But our hearts, like the disciples, are troubled. Not only are we troubled because we don't know the timeline that you have set for this, but our hearts are troubled because we are separated from our loved ones, Maybe some of us have lost jobs. Some of us are going through health issues. We lift up you, Christy, and Gary, and Dana, and Cindy, all who are dealing with cancer. We lift up you, Almighty God, um, Estrid, who's dealing with COVID-19. And all those people who are dealing with COVID-19, either, um, either physically or their fears of what they, if they might get it, that you administer to them mightily and bring healing to them in your time. We lift up you, mighty God, at this time, Hazel, as tomorrow she is scheduled to go through a uh, heart valve replacement. We ask you bless the medical teams and the doctors and nurses that she will be able to get through this procedure and get home to be with Ken as soon as she can. 
We ask, dear God, also that you would be with those of us who are struggling at this time. Let us keep our eyes upon you. Uh, let, us, uh, let us trust in your truth and your timing. Humble us for those of us who have suspicious attitudes and are angry. For God, you are our strength and our refuge. And remind us, dear God, that in your Son, Jesus, you have given us a promise. A prom many promises, but the promise is that you will never leave us and you will one day take us home to be with us. But in the meantime, you've given us a spirit, a spirit of power and of love and of discipline. So remind us, Heavenly Father, that we are not alone, that you have given us the strength to move on, and may that calm our troubled hearts. I give you thanks to God for our families today, whether we're together, sitting on the couch, separated, sitting on different couches, or that we've been separated by, by death itself. And I would humbly ask in the name of the resurrection and the life, the way, the truth, and the life, the one who gives us hope, that you remind us daily that those families formed us, grew us, and largely made us to be the people that we are. We ask, dear God, that you would be with our mothers, whether they are with you or we cannot be with them, or they're sitting right next to us on the couch. May we honor them and just give you thanks for the gift that they have and continue to be for us. I would also ask, Bonnie God, you would continue to be with all those who are helping us out during this time of COVID-19 pandemic, whether it be the leaders who are making decisions, the medical teams that are dealing with this and bringing healing, or might it be just the first responders who are going through at this, at this time, dealing with, with orders and, and, and issues that are having to make difficult decisions. For these people, we ask, dear God, that you will watch over them, keep them safe. May they know your presence and your power. And now, dear God, I wanna ask you, uh, we're gonna ask the people that are listening or watching this to spend just a few moments to lift their personal prayer request up to you. And if they don't have one, just to give you thanks for their mom by saying her name. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you, May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you. May he give you his shalom, his peace. Amen. So 